And ladies and gentlemen, we will now start off with this keynote address titled India's Desperate Need to Generate AI Talent for Business and Mass. And this session is brought to you by AI Labs. And our keynote speaker is Mr. Nabindu Gupta, member of Board of Advisory, DCG AI Labs Academy Private Limited. Before I hand him over the microphone, I would like to say a few words to introduce him. Mr. Nabindu Gupta has 28 years of corporate experience in India and overseas prior to launching Performance Edge after his postgraduate diploma in management from IIM Calcutta. He has worked in sales, marketing, and general management with the Tatas, Unilever, and Reckitt and Coleman, where he was general manager in Delhi. He, was subsequently, he has subsequently worked as vice president, Reliance Telecom, senior vice president, Pidilite Industries, and chief executive, Business Standard Limited. He has a certificate in executive coaching from the Indian School of Business and is a practicing executive coach. Ladies and gentlemen, we have on stage Mr. Nabindu Gupta, member of Board of Advisory, DCG AI Labs Academy, Private Limited. Please put your hands together for thank Mr. You. Gupta. Yeah. Warm welcome to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can you all hear me? Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, turn this on. Uh, AI Labs. Very much here. I make to the kidney check, can I? No, yeah. This is the one. So somebody is hidden that na shete. Thik achhe. I kore dichi. Yeah. Uh, first of all, can you all hear me, ladies and gentlemen? Loud and clear. Okay, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, AI Labs Academy and Infocom for giving me this opportunity to be here today. And you know, as the topic suggests, uh, India's desperate need to generate AI talent for business en masse. Now, this means that the AI, uh, artificial intelligence in India, is substantial is going to become even more substantial, and there is a lack of talent. Now, the moment you have this together, it's, it's a bit surprising, because India has such a large IT market with 42 lakh uh, IT professionals. Why should there be a shortage in something like artificial intelligence, uh, you know, which, which is something really still not taken off? Uh, how many of you find that to be surprising? Just raise your hands. Yeah, it, it is indeed surprising, isn't it? Now, what many of us in this room may not have realized is we are at the threshold of a paradigm change. Now, what is a paradigm change? A hundred years back, you had horses in the city of Calcutta, horse-drawn carriages. You didn't have motor cars. Today, it's the reverse. You only have motor cars, then you have a few horse-drawn carriages near Victoria Memorial. So when the motor car came, it drove out the horse-drawn carriages, and that is what we call a paradigm change. Now, in the recent past, I would say in the last 25 years, because of the way technology is evolving, we have seen quite a few paradigm changes around us, each of which significantly impacts the way we work. Now, one paradigm change is about 25 or 26 years back, I got my first laptop from the company. It was IBM ThinkPad. 
The cost of that laptop was 1,25,000 rupees, which was, you know, several times my salary, although I was in a senior position in a very well-known multinational. And that laptop was much, much weaker than this laptop in terms of computing power, speed of computing. 25 years back, mobile phones were introduced. If you remember, the incoming call was 16 rupees, outgoing calls were 16 rupees. How many of you remember that? And we would not normally give our phone numbers to others if we didn't know them. Because we, we were scared we would land up paying 16 rupees a minute. And look, and, and in fact, the landline ruled the roost. And you had to wait seven or eight years for a landline. If you had an OIT, you could get it for six months. Today, you get a mobile connection for within a day, and that too is because of KYC requirements. Now, what happens whenever there is a paradigm change is at the beginning, people don't, most people don't take it seriously. They don't realize that they are on the threshold of a paradigm change. In fact, some people tend to obstruct. For example, uh, you know, Thomas Watson, who was the first president of IBM, said that there is at the most a market for five computers in the world. You can Google that. You can Google that and you will come across many such instances how at the beginning of a paradigm change, there was all round resistance. Another famous one was when Dr. Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, rang up the then president of the United States, Rutherford Hayes. He said, President Hayes said, an amazing in instrument, but who on earth would like to use it? So that is the typical uh, sort of resistance which is faced at the time of any paradigm change. And, and before I go on to artificial intelligence, I'll just share with you a personal experience which I faced in the city of Calcutta at the onset of a paradigm change. Uh, many, many years back, 1976, I was a summer trainee in the factory of a leading multinational company in Kolkata, as a summer trainee from IAM Calcutta. And my project was computerization of their factory and dispatch system. After three days, the workers refused to let me work. Uh, what was the logic? The logic is, on the basis of my summer project report, computers would come in and they would lose their jobs, which, which was actually quite different from the truth. So you know, it, the, the senior manager, HR, all those people had to, to get involved so that you know, I could do my summer project in peace. Now, if you look today, which is the largest employer in the private sector in Kolkata? TCS, they employ 40,000 people in Kolkata and Rajarhat. And the others, Wipro, Cognizant, all these people are significantly large employers, despite all the fears that were there about computers coming in and people losing their jobs. So that is what happens at the beginning of a paradigm change. Now let's come to artificial intelligence. We would see one article in the papers every month, which has now become about one article in the ten, every 10 days. And what do these articles generally talk about? How many people will lose their jobs because of artificial intelligence? There was only one article two months back in the Indian Express that there are 50,000 jobs. It came out in the Indian Express. I'll give you the details. There were 50,000 jobs for IT professionals in artificial intelligence which could not be filled up. Now, 50,000 jobs on a base of 42 lakhs techies is 1.2%, which meant one techie out of 100 had to go for AI training. But despite that, for some reason, they chose not to go. And as we go along, we will see what those reasons could be. 
and what we at AI Labs are trying to do to address this challenge so that India doesn't get left behind in this uh, race for AI leadership. As of now, as I will show you, unlike IT, where India has the largest number of professionals in the world, it is way, way behind in, in the case of artificial intelligence. So, you know, many of you would be from an IT background. This doesn't re need repetition. So computers over the years have been, you know, programmed based on rules. I mean, when I started my career at IIM Calcutta, we learned things like BASIC, COBOL, FORTRAN. The young people wouldn't have heard those names. Uh, I, I would, now this is a question to people below 30. Have you heard these names? BASIC, COBOL, FORTRAN? Uh, sir, I think this is for people below th 30. Uh, the youngsters, have you heard these names? So you have heard the names. Okay, very good. I thought people, people don't know what these are about, the youngsters. So, so these rules were based on deductive logic. And the data used to be largely structured. Then what happened? The AI has today has changed this model on its head. So you have statistical and machine learning algos uh, and fancily coined neural networks. Uh, and these are sort of uh, you know, programmed to track sophisticated patterns. And these have amazing predictive capabilities. Uh, you must have heard that you know, grandmasters are being beaten in chess thanks to AI. Uh, and a you know, few years back, our very own Vishwanathan uh, Anand used to play with five computers simultaneously and beat all five. But today, it's been reversed thanks to AI. And it's just, you know, it's just showing sort of some of the things which AI is capable of. So all this has been made possible due to big data, GPU chips, and you know, mathematical advances in algorithms. So what is happening thanks to the development in AI Artificial intelligence can ultimately defeat human experts in predictive capabilities. And, uh, you know, I, I read recently in the papers, this was by e Ernst & Young, that by 2022, that is four years from now, 25% of the jobs in, currently in IT will vanish, thanks to AI. Now, what will happen is many more jobs will be created for people who know AI. You know, if you look at Kolkata as an IT center, it is ranked seventh in India and way below the top six. But how many of you know that the first computer in India was installed in Kolkata? It is called ECU-1. Indian Statistical University, uh, Institute and Jadavpur University, it was installed at ISI. So th this would be about, Dr. Das, about 45 years back? 1966. 1966, so 52 years back, right? And so that's where we started. Look where we are today, but it can be reversed. So, you know, what we are going to do, there are lots of details in, these, in this PPT. If you are interested, we'll give you an email ID. Please write to us, and we'll mail a PDF format across to you. Right? Because uh, I, I'll probably be sharing with you 30% of what is there in the PPT, uh, the balance 70%. Uh, I mean, the entire PPT will be mailed to you, so you can go through it at leisure. And if you have any questions, we would be delighted to respond. Uh, there is a video over here. Excuse me. Acha, amar eta ke ek tu ye kora hoye chhe. Jajjon ne amar play around kora hoye chhe. Jajjon amar videos gulo. They seem to have disappeared. Uh, 
in the reprogramming, reconfiguration of my laptop, Dekhi. Excuse me, who's the person who reprogrammed my computer? There were three videos in the computer. Hmm. It seems to have disappeared in the reprogramming. Ah, I found it. Excuse me, yeah. It's, 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 the folder has surfaced now. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to do is take you to a three-minute clip by Andrew Ang. And you know, he's one of the thought leaders of AI. He's come out with Coursera courses on machine learning and AI. And, and just listen to him on AI is the new electricity. Whatever industry you work in, AI will probably transform it. Just as maybe about 100 years ago, electricity transformed in whatever industry you work in, AI just will probably transform it. Just as maybe about 100 years ago, electricity transformed industry after industry, volume, everything from volume. transportation, communications, uh, manufacturing, volume. healthcare was transformed with the rise of electricity. I'm, I'm I think that today we see a surprisingly clear path for AI to transform all of these industries. So I actually hope that whatever industry you are in, that you, you know, figure out how to leverage AI because I think it will create new winners and losers in almost every category. One very common pattern you see a lot of industries is that first the industry is digitized, so that you know, activities move to computers, so that creates data, and that's the first kind of IT transformation wave. And then with the data, that gives AI an opportunity to come in and eat the data and automate decisions or do things more intelligently. So for example, I think the uh, online advertising realm, uh, possibly the most, uh, single most lucrative application of AI today might be online advertising, right? Deciding what ad to, to, to show people. Because um, the online advertising realm has always been a digital realm, so there's tons of data. The AI for that is very sophisticated today. Healthcare has been a little bit further behind. Uh, in the United States, over the last eight years or so, I guess, the uh, Affordable Care Act, or the rise of electronic medical records, um, is creating data, and now it is at the face for the industry for AI to come and eat that data. I think education is a little bit further behind. A lot of education is still offline, analog. So let's be predictive. You mentioned my, my nine-year-old twins earlier, so they're in the phase now of coming to me and saying what they want to be when they grow up. Um, what things that they might say to me should I tell them that, I'm sorry, that job won't exist when you're an adult? Radiology is one you've mentioned before. That's, that's in the crosshairs, right? What, yeah. what, where, where, else, where else is like in the, in the target zone? Yeah, you know, the, the, the radiology point, if any of you have, I don't know, friends or children or whatever studying med school, and AI is getting much better at reading radiology images, frankly. So if any of your friends are going through medical school and graduating with like a degree in radiology, I think they might have a perfectly fine five-year career as a radiologist. <laughs> the, the broader pattern is that um, in any task where there are a lot of people doing ru relatively routine, repetitive work, when a lot of people are kind of doing very similar things, that creates a very strong incentive for AI teams to come and automate that task. So we talked a lot about self-driving cars. I think that will displace a lot of workers, call center operators. Many people doing relatively similar things will, will, will displace that. Um, so th there's actually a, one other rule of thumb. You know, th this thing, what can AI do, is a little bit of a mysterious concept. So there's one highly imperfect rule of thumb I've sometimes offered my teams, which is um, almost anything that a typical, typical human can do in, uh, with, with less than one second of mental thought, we can probably now or in the near future automate using AI, such as um, security guard looking at a video feed and saying, are there people in this? Are they doing something suspicious? That task is actually taking a lot of one second judgment things and stringing them together. And so I think a lot of that job can also be automated. Whatever industry you work in, AI will probably transform it. Just as maybe about 100 years ago, electricity transformed industry after industry. Everything from transportation, communications, uh, manufacturing, healthcare was transformed with the rise of electricity. I think that today we see a surprisingly clear path for AI to transform. It, it, uh...
এটা অন আছে তো হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে থ্যাংক ইউ সো ইউ নো লাইক ইলেকট্রিসিটি ট্রান্সফর্ম দ্য ওয়ে উই লিভ এ আই ইজ গোয়িং টু ট্রান্সফর্ম দ্য ওয়ে উই লিভ ইন ফিউচার অ্যান্ড দ্যাট ফিউচার ইজ নট টু ফার আওয়ে Now, if you look at AI, it's making differences across functional areas, but the biggest impact is in retail, transport and logistics. Uh, yeah, these are the two big ones. Uh, and there are, of course, others. And the total impact is about three to six trillion dollars. And this is going to grow exponentially because what you're seeing now are very nascent steps in the development of AI, right? Now, uh, there are two videos over here, but I'll just show you one because, you know, I will press for time because actually these videos bring you at par with what the thought leaders are saying. This is Michael, Ch Michael Chui. We've actually surveyed for uh, two years now. Now, um, you know, those of us who are in software know that you know, we have uh, you know, questions about the degree to which we want to have backward compatibility. Well, uh, we asked a certain set of questions in 2017. We asked a slightly different set of questions, so they're not perfectly comparable. But in 2017, we did identify, uh, you know, out of thousands of executives that we surveyed, roughly 20% of companies uh, had either deployed AI at scale or in a core business process. Now, we didn't ask exactly the same questions this year, but we think that they're roughly comparable. And that said, about 50% of companies now, or 50% of our respondents, say that their companies have deployed AI and embedded it in standard operating processes within at least one business unit or function. So not exactly the same question, but you know, that 20 and 50% are roughly comparable. And the top line is definitely comparable, right? In terms of anyone who's uh, done anything, including piloting, going from 60 to, to um, uh, 61 to 77%. So we are seeing what we view as accelerating adoption of this technology. And in fact, if you try to, if, if you try, we did try, we asked, where have you actually deployed these technologies? And we, we've cut it you know, by industry sector, we've cut it by use cases, we have a lot of detailed data, but I'm gonna share just one finding here. Uh, fortunately, it looks like that corporate executives are deploying AI where, there's the, where the most value can be found. So again, if you think, again, the, the, the vertical lines are uh, different functions within the enterprise. Look, it, you know, where has service ops, where has AI been deployed most in service ops? In the telecom sector, that makes sense. There are a lot of service ops questions in, in, in telecom. In product development, high tech is the, the sector which leads there. That makes sense because by the way, when we talked about product development, that included embedding AI into products and services. So that, that's primarily what did there as opposed to AI taking the place of, uh, of engineers. Marketing, sales, and retail, that makes perfect sense as well. Same with supply chain. And then, you know, manufacturing being, um, you know, one of the places where AI has been adopted in automotive and assembly also makes sense. And then also risk in financial services. So in some ways, there's a tremendously good story about the way that AI has been adopted already, even in, uh, I'll describe it as short history, although we all know that AI is, you know, over uh, half a century old. Uh, but in terms of this recent wave of AI, we do see it, you know, the acceleration. Okay, I'm a bit pressed for time. I have uh, precisely five minutes left. But all these links are in your, uh, you know, in what we will uh, sort of send you. Uh, and uh, you can get access to it. Now, yeah, this is what I was talking about. In the Indian Express, there's a vacancy for 50,000 data scientists and AI specialists in India, which are going a begging, despite having 42 lakh software professional. 
Now, why is this problem? This problem is because, you know, our entire education in IT tends to be on the technology of AI rather than the business impact of AI. And all the opportunities are in the business impact of AI. And so, so that's where we at AI Labs are focused on. Right. So 90% of challenge in AI finds, uh, lies in aggregating, cleaning, storing, and feeding the data to unearth the problems for AI to solve. Right. So that's what we at AI Labs are focused on, is how do you leverage big data analytics and predictive skills to solve problems in sales and marketing, production and supply chain, and, and then you know, lead young people to worthwhile careers as data analysts, business analysts. And so these are our plans currently in Kolkata, and then we're going to spread out to Bengaluru, Hyderabad, and Pune by next year, and then spread further. And uh, our long-term strategy is to evolve a continuous learning program and job matching platform where we use our global links. And uh, well, this, before we come to our team, what is you know, our rise on the eighth ray? How are we different from the others? See, today what you have is you have these top level uh, sort of AI programs that Triple IT Hyderabad, IIT Bombay, IIT Kanpur, IIT Kharagpur. You have this uh, very highly rated program, I'm Calcutta uh, Business Analytics, which has been rated 14th in the world and number one in the world by far for employability and alumni. So on one hand, you have this huge opportunity uh, of high caliber AI education on the other hand, you have 50,000 jobs which are going a begging, and that is where we are at AI. We, we are going to be focused on bringing AI to the masses. Because you've, you've got you know, very good quality world-class institutes in India which are bringing AI to the classes. So we are going to be focused on bringing AI to the masses. And uh, that is, as I said, our rise on the eighth ray. Now, this is our team, and uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, apart from our chairperson, uh, Mrs. Ghosh, we have uh, some of my very uh, sort of senior colleagues and eminent AI experts, Dr. Pradeep Das and uh, Dr. Chiranjit Acharya with us. And you can catch up with them during the breaks. And uh, I've run out of time. Uh, so if there are any queries or you wish to receive a copy of this presentation, if you can just send a mail to info at ailabs.academy. Just, just note this number uh, sort of address down, info at ailabs.academy. And we would be delighted to get back to you, first, of course, with this presentation, to uh, with, respond to any queries which you have. And I just have one request uh, before I sort of sign off. There is one more uh, video which I couldn't show you for the paucity of time. Please watch that video. Uh, and, and there's just one thing which I didn't like about my presentation today. All the three speakers, the two you saw, and the third one are all Chinese. And what I want is next time I make a presentation on this subject, there should be at least one Indian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Namindu Gupta. May I request you to kindly remain on stage, sir, for just a couple of more minutes. And I will request Mr. Suman Banerjee, Associate Vice President, Human Resources, ABP Private Limited, to kindly come forward and present a memento to Mr. Namindu Gupta. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. That was, a, that was a very interesting presentation. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me so patiently and being so appreciative. Thank you.